KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger, a public affairs program featuring stories from all over the Central Valley with Sevag Tediosian, 90.7 KFSR. I'm your host, Sevag Tatiosian. Welcome to the beautiful CMAC studios in downtown Fresno and the Central Valley Ledger. Our guest this week is Professor Khachik Moradian. He is a visiting Kazan professor with the Armenian Studies Program at Fresno State. First of all, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Fresno? Because originally you're not from Fresno. Uh, so I am here for one semester. Uh, teaching at Fresno State in the Armenian Studies program. I'm teaching a course on uh, the Armenian Genocide and 20th century Armenian history. Originally, I'm from Lebanon. I moved here almost a decade ago. I've been teaching at the Rutgers University over the past few years. I received my PhD from Clark University uh, again very recently. And uh, my focus is, uh, uh, my research focuses on uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, modern Armenian history, and in particular my dissertation deals with Armenian refugees during the Armenian Genocide as they arrived in Ottoman Syria. Today, is there still a refugee problem? Because, you know, right now, in, and you can explain this a little bit better, but there are communities that in the Middle East of Armenians that are, n that are not staying there, they're continuing. So I is this a continuation of the crisis? There is, uh, the world is facing, and you know, we see this in the news every day, the world is facing one of the major humanitarian crises that has to do with refugees. Uh, one of the biggest such crises since World War II. Uh, in that regard, the Middle East is in fact one of the, uh, the, the hot spots of this crisis. Uh, whether uh, in recent years the situation in Syria, earlier uh, other conflicts and wars in the region, have been at the focus of, of this crisis. Now, in many ways, as I was writing my uh, dissertation, doing my research on uh, the situation, the plight of Armenians uh, during the Armenian Genocide, as they were being deported from all over the Ottoman Empire into Ottoman Syria, uh, the, uh, many of the places, many of the sites of massacres, many of the places where there were concentration camps, uh, are the very same places where today massacres are taking place in Syria, where today you have thousands of people, tens of thousands of people being forced out of their homes. So it was a very chilling uh, experience, you know, you know tr delving into these documents that took me back a hundred years ago. <laughs> while on television I was watching and hearing names like Arraqqa, which is the de facto capital of the Islamic State, uh, and also figures prominently in my research. Places like Deir Zor, one of the, again, the flashpoints of this conflict and the war. It's, uh, so in that sense, yes, uh, it, you know, history seems to be repeating itself. One of the places that Armenians came after the genocide was Fresno. You know, they built a community here. They did very well in multiple sectors, the Fresno Armenians. When you're talking, uh, are people enjoying hearing this or are they supportive? I guess the better question from me to you is, how has the community welcomed you? I have to say that uh, I was, uh, the, the community has been from day one, uh, very helpful, very welcoming. I was, uh, I was joking the other day at a talk that it takes a village to help me move. And that's exactly what the Armenian community in, in, in Fresno did. And you know, I've already made uh, so many friends here. Uh, this has been really a warm reception. I have to add to it that several of my students are also Armenian uh, and their stories, their history is also part of the discussions that we have in class as we delve into Armenian history. Where did most of the Armenians go after the genocide? I know some of them came to Fresno, but particularly where did most of them go? Now, uh, beginning in, uh, during the Armenian genocide, many of the Armenians were being uh, pushed, the surviving Armenians, towards uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, also Jordan, uh, so, so these were some of, some of the areas where there were concentrations of Armenians at the end of World War I, but also in other directions as well. In fact, uh, a large number of Armenians in the following decade or two went uh, west. Many others continued leaving Turkey 
even after the establishment of the Turkish Republic in the 1920s, uh, again, going south to the Middle East in general, to Europe, United States. But these were not on the only directions. In fact, uh, a few thousand Armenians went east uh, and not only stopped in the Caucasus where there was, uh, for a brief period of time, an independent Armenian Republic. It eventually became, was part of the Soviet Union, so many thousands went in that direction. But several thousand Armenians, in fact, went farther east and ended up in places like uh, northeastern China, in places like Harbin, in places like Vladivostok in, in, in Russia. So, so the, the scatter of the Armenian community, the, the Ottoman Empire had a, a, a population of around 2 million Armenians before the genocide. And uh, by the end of the world, world War I, uh, two-thirds of that population was annihilated, and the surviving population essentially was scattered around the world, from China to uh, North Africa, to the Middle East, to Europe, and the United States. Shifting gears a little bit, when you heard that, you know, I don't know what the process uh, was when you learned that, you know, you were going to come to Fresno, but when you got word that, you know, you're going to Fresno, any second thoughts, or did you say, you know what, I want to go there? I was in Fresno a few months before for a conference, before I received news that I've been uh, invited to this program, and uh, for a conference at uh, CSU Fresno. And uh, so that was my introduction. Before that, I had been here once as well. I had found uh, the community very warm, and I was looking forward to uh, you know, being involved in the Armenian Studies program. You know, uh, a lot of what I do and I focus on is very much about uh, you know, having the opportunity to teach and share what I have learned and, uh, uh, with, with students and, and learn from them. And, and in that respect, uh, I knew even as I said a few months before when I came uh, to Fresno that this was an environment that is, is very open to that and this was an environment where I would be happy teaching, uh, conducting research. So in that sense, I think I'm in the right place. Why should the person in Fresno or any other person care about this incident that occurred a hundred years ago? Obviously I care because my grandparents were affected you know, my yes. great-grandparents were affected. My grandpa's brother was killed. His parents were killed. He's the only survivor. So for me, it's personal. But as everybody's living their life, we're all busy. We've got families. We've got friends. We've got things to do. We've got jobs. Why keep bringing this up? Why is that important? Uh, thank you. That's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if the reason I was involved uh, I, I wanted to pursue uh, research in the Arme in study and study the Armenian genocide was necessary or at least only because of my Armenian roots. Uh, part of the reason, in fact, was that I, I grew up in Lebanon during the Civil War. Essentially, I, my I spent my entire childhood and you know, early teens uh, during the Civil War in Lebanon. And, and that experience, I think, was the trigger. The reason I, I say this is because I've learned and I've come to uh, share this with uh, my students that, you know, violence, war, mass violence casts a very long shadow. It's not something that is over when the killing stops. It's not something that is over when there's some kind of agreement that is signed between warring parties. And uh, the Armenian Genocide for me is the entry point to think about mass violence, to think about war, to think about resistance. One of the things that I emphasize in my research and in my teaching is the fact that no matter in what difficult circumstances individuals find themselves, even when there's absolutely no light at the end of the tunnel, no end in sight, right? Uh, even when people are completely helpless, they will still uh, take a stand. They will still resist. Uh, you know, resistance generally is associated in our minds with weapons and armed resistance. But people resist in, ev in, in so many different ways. This entire spectrum of ways in which people say no to any kind of oppression, any kind of violence. Uh, and again, uh, uh, the, the Armenian Genocide, the study of the Armenian Genocide for me is an entry point to this world. And 
through that, through that lens, I try to look at mass violence in general, refugee crises in general. So I do think that, uh, again, uh, there's a lot that we can, uh, we can learn from specific cases of, of mass violence uh, that has to do with the past. But beyond that, I said earlier that mass violence casts a long shadow, genocide casts a long shadow. A lot of these people are living among us. The children, the grandchildren of many of the survivors are living among us. Their stories are part of the story of America. You just mentioned Fresno, right? Uh, so many Armenians before the genocide, but also many others after, uh, came here. They are American citizens. Many survivors lived the last decades of their lives in this country. They're buried on in this land. And it's important to think of their stories as a story of America as well. And in that sense also, I think there's, there's relevant relevance to this in, this, uh, in the here and now. When did you decide this is the area of study that you want to get into? I mean, did you just, you know, when you were in grade school say, oh, I'm going to get into this? Or uh, when was it that you said, you know what, there's more here that's interesting and I want to keep digging? Uh, my path uh, through uh, education has been like a meandering road. I've been, my, <laughs> under, <laughs> my undergraduate was in biology. Uh, my master's was in clinical psychology. And then I, I, I came uh, to the States. I, I did, a, again, pursued graduate studies in conflict resolution and then uh, applied for a P to a PhD program. Now, so these, but there is a method to this madness somewhere in this meandering. I, I, I owe a lot to my training initially in biology and in the sciences and then eventually to psychology. And a lot of this essentially uh, sent me in the direction of uh, looking into history and trying to uh, reflect on it and trying to uh, write about it and study it. So I think in many ways this was a process that did not really crystallize until a few <laughs> years ago. As you started researching the genocide, as you started learning more about stuff that I'm sure as a child you were told and you learned about in your schools as a child, wh did stuff kind of, new stuff come up and you're, you just said, wow, what, what is this? You know, uh, often uh, when we, uh, the enormity of, of a crime, and uh, I'm let, you know, let me focus f you know, on the Armenian genocide here, uh, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to think of the Armenian genocide as, you know, beginning in 1915, uh, the Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire, Ottoman Turkey, was deported. Up to one and a half million Armenians were killed in this process. This was one of the, you know, first, one of the earliest cases of genocide in the 20th century. Uh, this is a summary that gives you, does not really give you the scope and enormity of the crime. Uh, one of the things that I realized as I was digging deeper and deeper into my specific region, which was, as I said, S Ottoman Syria, was that the Armenian genocide is not as horrible as we think. It's, in fact, more horrible than we think. So what we think about it, and as awful as I know it to be based on stories, it's even worse is what you're telling me. Yes, because I do think that in many ways, as you dig deeper and deeper and look at, uh, you know, and, and you focus on one region. The region that I focus on is the place where in the summer of 1916, uh, th there was the largest massacre of Armenians. Around uh, 200,000 Armenians were massacred in just in one location, mostly women and children. And again, these are just numbers. But once you start focusing on, uh, on the details, looking into these memoirs, these accounts, these survivor accounts, the, the missionary accounts, the Ottoman archives, and you try to piece together this, this story, you realize the enormity of the loss. You realize and you start, uh, you know, one of the things that has happened during my research is that, you know, as I discover more and more about individuals or families or groups of people who were being deported and, and their odyssey, it's, uh, you know, the persons, these stories that come to life uh, really is are it's, it's an opportunity for us not to think about mass violence only in terms of numbers, because numbers can be numbing. Numbers cannot give you the enormity. But in terms of individuals, in terms of the fact, you know, think about them as not just the million and a half Armenians who were killed, but 
one Armenian with dreams and aspirations and family and friends, right, being killed, and then one and a half million times over. Uh, it's important to realize this again because uh, so much has been lost, and it's not just the lives. There's this entire culture and heritage this that was continent. destroyed. Yes. This almost continent that was lost. Yes, and 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 you know, complete utter dispossession of an entire group, civilization, and and loss from their ancestral hom homes, and so that loss really weighs very heavy as you try to look into these these dreams that are shadows, and you discover these fascinating individuals who, again, in the darkest hour of hours of World War One, figured out ways of not just to go to their deaths like sheep but find ways of organizing and uh, engaging in things like humanitarian resistance, uh, helping others, trying to help others escape, etc. So I asked this question to many of the professors and the people who study the Middle East. And uh, it's a hypothetical question. It may be, and, and there, there may be a right answer. They may not be. If there was no Armenian genocide, would the current state of the Middle East be what it is today? That's a tough one. <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, it's d first, it's, it's difficult. You know, when, when we start thinking in history as in ifs, ifs and, and, and buts and try to uh, imagine alternate scenarios, it, uh, you know, we're essentially, we, don't, we have very little to base it on. But uh, history is the study of what happened, right? But on the other hand, there are certain things that we can take away from the current course that uh, the Middle East has taken over the past century and has led us to this point. And a lot of it has to do with, of course, imperialism, colonialism. A lot of it has to do with drawing, uh, you know, arbitrary boundaries, borders by people not really uh, knowing well the dynamics and the demographic, demographics of the region. But also a lot has to do uh, with, uh, with the general, uh, with uh, the way in which this transition from empire, empires to states and republics occurred. And in many ways, the decisions that certain leaders made as they reflected and thought about the direction they want to take their, uh, uh, their empire and their country. And I think in that regard, the Armenian genocide is significant in a sense that, uh, you know, the Armenian genocide was not inevitable. The Armenian Genocide is not about uh, any kind of uh, group that is, you know, evil by nature, and it's unleashing a violence against another group that is, uh, you know, uh, just just there to uh, to just to take over their land and property and annihilate them. Uh, <coughs> it was a calculated act of uh, ethnically cleansing uh, the Ottoman Empire, Turkey, and. Uh, and, and destroying the, uh, the multicultural life reality of many of the cities and villages and towns in the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> so, but that was not an, you know, uh, uh, inevitable. It was a decision that was made. It was a conscious decision. It could have other alternative paths were indeed possible. And this kind of rejection of the other, this kind of uh, you know, solving problems through murder, violence, oppression, is not something, again, it casts a very long shadow. It's not something that you can immediately disown. You get away with it, you try to do it again. You try to do it again, and there you will engage, you will find yourself in this culture of violence, and in this cycle of violence. And there is much that can be said about this. If we look at the situation in the Middle East today, if we look at Turkey today and the way the Kurds are being uh, persecuted, if you look at the region in general and Turkey's policies in places like northern Syria and elsewhere. I, so I do think that, uh, you know, a, a vision, a different vision of finding possi the possibility, looking for the possibility of different groups living together uh, and, and having equal rights could have led in a, as, as you alluded to in your question, could have led in a very, very different direction. What is your goal here in Fresno? I mean, okay, so you're going to teach classes, but is there, do you have a goals here while you're here? 
So as I said, the uh, primary purpose uh, for me here is to teach. Uh, that is my primary purpose everywhere I go. But at the same time, this is also an opportunity for me uh, because my teaching load is, uh, uh, you know, like is not as heavy as uh, before. Uh, elsewhere, uh, I'm also focusing on turning my dissertation into a book. That is the I'm at the tail end of that process, and also uh, Fresno, as you mentioned earlier, is one of the, uh, you know, is, it is one of the earliest uh, places where Armenians coming from the Ottoman Empire primarily settled. And this has been an opportunity for me to learn more about this community, <laughs> not just about its present, its past, but also it's about, about its present. So that has also been an interesting experience for me uh, here. Uh, ultimately, uh, my goal is uh, I'm here for the rest of the, the rest of the semester, and then I leave. And ultimately, my goal is to leave Fresno, uh, having learned a little more, and also at the same time having left a little bit of my uh, stamp in, a, in the way I perceive and think about these issues uh, on, uh, you know, academic life, scholarly life, in, and, and community life in Fresno. What do you teach at your home university? I, at Rutgers, I teach uh, in the history and sociology departments. The courses I teach are, in, uh, I, had, I teach a course on the history of concentration camps uh, beginning in the late 1800s. I teach a course on uh, called Imperialism and Mass Violence, which again focuses on the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, we look at different uh, cases, case studies. And I teach a course called Amending Atrocities, which focuses on how societies deal with skeletons in their closet. So it looks at how societies deal with mass violence in their past, whether it's through admitting guilt, apologizing, confronting it, learning about it, or the more common version is denial, trying to forget it, trying to trivialize it, trying to sweep it under the rug. And then what are the different ways in which uh, public discourse, how is public discourse shaped in this regard? And uh, so this, th that it's, it's a course that really looks at uh, these uh, different processes in societies as they grapple with the past. I'm going to put you on the spot with this one again, which you did an excellent job last time yeah. when I put you on the spot. But why is recognition so important? I mean, right now, there is organizations, there's people that have dedicated all their lives for recognition of this atrocity that in our minds know it's true. Yeah. Why is it important for the government of Turkey and for the rest of the world to say this genocide did occur? Let me start with a story. <laughs> I remember very well, uh, as a, as a, in my, it, it must have been in my early teens, I visited, uh, back in Lebanon, I visited one of the women that we knew. She was a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. And I was very excited, because at that point, uh, 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 there was some, some talk about uh, recognition of the Armenian Genocide uh, in, in the United States. And uh, I remember uh, going up to her, telling her, uh, you know, there's this talk, you know, about genocide recognition. Uh, remember, these are women, these are people, survivors, who spent their entire life, right, after, you know, that uh, horror that they experienced, right, with the scars of that crime. And she told me I would not uh, rest and be happy uh, until Turkey itself recognizes the Armenian Genocide. So it's important uh, for a lot of these people uh, who have since passed away, uh, the mere recognition of the Armenian Genocide would have meant a lot. Because denial, what denial does is it tells the victim that what you experienced did not happen. And having to live with that, and the in the case of the Armenian Genocide, having to live with that for a century, but, uh, this is organized denial, funded by a state. The most aggressive case of denial you can imagine, because again, the, 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 the enormity of the effort that goes into it. 
that fina the finances that is uh, that goes into it is tremendous, as you know. So for these women, for these survivors, for these men who lived through the genocide and survived, that was the sole consolation. Uh, and the and that I was did the it. Whole the whole that yes, the sense that you know what uh, the perpetrator, the the descendants of the perpetrators, in fact, uh, acknowledged this. And many, pe those many of those survivors never saw that. In fact, the first time there was an open air commemoration of the Armenian Genocide in Turkey, by civil society, by very small groups of human rights, very small human rights groups, was on the 95th anniversary of the genocide. And th in, in 2000, and then uh, 2010, and then in 2015, last year, there was again, there were a few uh, small commemorations of the genocide. And I seeing many diasporan Armenians who were there, I was there at the time as well, on April 24, 2015, the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, seeing their faces, seeing how they felt as a few thousand Turks and Kurds and others gathered together to commemorate the Armenian Genocide uh, was re really telling, right? These were the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of genocide survivors. Their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents never saw this. Yet just a few thousand Armenians, Kurds, and Turks getting together to commemorate this meant so much to them. Imagine if the Turkish state, the, the state that, ha that is not only, p uh, the Turkish government today, the Turkish state today, is not responsible for the killing of a million and a half Armenians 100 years ago. But it is responsible for the century of denial and for continuing the denial. And it is responsible for reaping the benefits of that genocide. Right? Uh, we it's, it's important for us to think about this in that regard, in a sense that uh, we do not just, we should not just take pride in the great things that is part of our history and our past. We should also take ownership of the violence and, and the skeletons that are in our closet. And on that note, we are out of time, Professor Moradian, or else we would love to continue this avenue. Thank you for making the time uh, for coming to Fresno and making the time to come to the studio this time. Thank you for having me. That's all for this edition of the Central Valley Ledger. We're recording out of the beautiful studios of the Community Media Access Collaborative in downtown Fresno. Our guest this week was Professor Khachik Moradian. He is the visiting professor at the uh, Fresno State Armenian Studies program. Check out their website for upcoming lectures that Professor Meridian will be talking about. I'm your host, Sevag Tatiosian. Thank you to the volunteer crew that made this production and every production possible. They're in the studios now behind the cameras and in the studio making us look and sound good. Tune in next week to a new edition. KFSR and CMAC present the Central Valley Ledger every Sunday morning at 1130. For complete program schedule, visit KFSR.org.